First thing I have to say is that the only reason Colorado really has a program like we do is not because of Dwayne, it's because of people like Bob and the registrants that have been very open to talk to me. Uh, when I started, I came with zero cannabis knowledge. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> former commissioner asked me when I was starting what I knew about cannabis and my comment to him was, the only thing I know is that there are two types. One that you smoke and one that you get tied up if you get caught smoking it where I grew up. So uh, that was the extent of my knowledge. I thought I'd blown the job interview and he said, ah, that's all right. It's only gonna take five or 10% of your time of which I now, when I ask him whether he underestimated that or if he thought I was working 600 hours a week. So uh, anyway, uh, with, with that, uh, I'll get started a little bit about uh, our program, uh, how we got to where we did, what we do, what we don't do, uh, and then kind of lay that over to the Farm Bill and uh, w some of the changes we see occurring. Now, let's see if we can make this work. So, you probably all know what industrial hemp is, uh, you know, and, and how it's separated. It's the 0.3 THC concentration. Uh, this is the federal definition. It almost perfectly mirrors Colorado's current definition in the Constitution. Uh, the difference is, is we don't use cannabis sativa, we use the genus cannabis, but that, that, that's pretty much it. <clears throat> A little bit of an idea of how this has grown. 2014 is where we started. Uh, the numbers that you see there are the estimated numbers between, that states have reported to themselves, to each other, uh, in what was produced since 2014 when we started. Uh, and 2014 is when Colorado started. One thing you ought to be aware is the language that we have, the language in our rules, our act, all predates the Farm Bill. So that creates a few problems. And, and I'll try to touch on them just a little bit uh, as we move forward. But you can see the numbers in parentheses our Colorado's contribution to the total. And you can see that's significant. It started off with almost 90%. We're now down to probably 30% of the total uh, uh, industrial hemp. And a lot of people think, boy, that's, you know, you're sliding. And, and the answer is, no, look at the growth we've had in each year. Other states are joining. And that's really the, the message that I need to make sure that we get across. Uh, Colorado has been a leader. It has not ever been our goal to always be number one. Our goal has been to help other states bring their programs on so that this is an industry that can, that can happen on a broad national scale interstate basis. So we believe we'll always have the opportunity to be a leader. We believe that we have some inherent things here in Colorado that position us better, but it doesn't mean we have to be 90% of the total market. So what are our roles? Uh, we we uh, issue R&D permits and we issue commercial permits. And the commercial permits have been the controversial one. Uh, and that language was because this passed before the Farm Bill. Now, we interpret the Farm Bill, and we'll get, we'll get there a little, uh, little later, a little different than other states. And I can tell you how we got there and why other states look at it a little different. So for us, we register a land area we it's a voluntary program if you don't register with us you can grow all the cannabis you want just understand that it is an illegal cannabis grow it does not matter what the thc is in order to participate in hemp production you have to be registered with the state pilot program uh, and if you are you have some protections from federal prosecution uh, and from state prosecution we also go out and register and inspect those land areas uh, and we try to work with the industry, really, uh, to understand what the industry's concerns are. Uh, Bob jokes, and we joke back and forth all the time, we don't always agree on how to measure something the most accurately. Actually, we may, we may believe closer than, than we both think we do. We may not want to measure as accurately. <laughs> as, as, uh, so, three parts to the program. Uh, 
w if you're registered with the state, boy, if you, if you notice me walking around, I'm, I'm one of these people, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm really constrained just in between two things here because I'm, I'm a walker and a talker. Uh, anyway, uh, there's three components to our program. Uh, one is the registration portion. Uh, that tells us where it's being grown. It tells us who's growing it, but it's really important that we know where it's grown. Uh, then there are the reporting part, pre-planting report, planning report, a harvest report, and finally, an inspection and sampling portion of the program. You know, if you look at the marijuana rules, it's probably 300 and some pages long. It's, it's, it literally is a bound book. Ours is about nine pages, 10 pages. That doesn't include the 12 or 13 pages that def describe why we put those rules in place. So uh, w there's minimal, minimal rules to, to, to really that you're trying to follow. So the registration portion, again, it's for a specific land area. It's not just a person, it is a land area. And that's important to understand because once that product leaves a land area or who has the rights to that is tied to the land area. So if three people are working one land area, two of those people work another land area, it is the land area that we're concerned with. And that's so that we know where the material is while it is under cultivation because the Department of Ag only has jurisdiction over cultivation. Okay? Anyone that's got 10% ownership though has to be on there. And that's so that we can find if we have bad players, that we have a way to keep them from registering another land area. Okay, the reports that are required, there's a pre-planting report. I often joke this is the, mo this may be the most worthless report the state's ever created for a purpose that we wish we never had to have. <laughs> uh, we, we had someone that registered in Nestor Hemp Field, called us, told us he wouldn't give us access and that he was growing marijuana because we never asked what he was planting before. So now we had a registered land area, the department had a no trespassing issue offered against us. So you can thank pretty much one individual if you're filling out reports for making you fill out a report that I personally think is stupid. But that's just the only way we can get to where we need to be. So, uh, so there's a pre-planting report. It says, yes, I'm gonna grow hemp. I've applied to grow hemp and I am going to grow hemp. Then there's a planting report. That tells us what you did plant. And, it, and where you planted inside that registered land area. And the last is a harvest report, and you turn that in at least 30 days before. And that gives you a harvesting window of about 10 days, five days before that date, five days after that date. That, that can be amended if it's amended later. Uh, you have to do it, you have to communicate with us. If it's later, we may come out and test again to make sure that you're not just trying to delay a harvest. And if it's earlier, we may ask you to hold the crop in a place until we get the test results back. But that's about the time frame. It literally takes us to come out, get us an inspector scheduled to come out and get the results back from the lab so that we know that it is industrial hemp entering the stream of commerce and, and nothing else. Okay? And that's the inspection and uh, sampling portion. The program has the ability to go out uh, and sample, but we don't have the capacity to sample everyone. So what we do is we do a risk and random. We take those folks that are higher risk, might be because of the way they've acted, might be the guy that told us we couldn't come on his property. Now we've got rights to go onto his property. So he, he'd be a pretty high risk. He's gonna get sampled a lot. Uh, and, and, and we do that because we've got people that are legitimately trying to do this. We wanna make sure that the black eyes stay out of the business for everyone else. So we can make those, uh, uh, sample and inspections before harvest, after harvest, we can do it d during harvest, we can do it announced or unannounced. We try to work with the industry and in most cases, 95, 96, 97% of the time, it's an announced. We schedule when to come out, we want you to be there, we want you to see what we're doing, and we wanna build a relationship with our registrants because that's how we know who the good players are. So understanding why it's important, it's uh, really provisions of the Farm Bill, as well as the Farming Act of 2018, uh, they're gonna require you, you register with us. Uh, without a hemp registration, as I said, it's not a legal cannabis grow. So you, you, you need to understand, not only if you're growing, 
But what if you're doing research, where's the source of that material? Don't be buying stuff that's just, or, or working with stuff that just is below 0.3. If you don't know, it came from someplace registered because that's critical to what you're doing even beyond the cultivation part. Understand your risks. Sourcing that material, whether you're growing or you're using it, is coming from someone that's registered. So what does the Farm Bill say that we're operating under now? Uh, I, I put up there, and, and most of this is paraphrased, uh, except the first part, to study the growth, cultivation, or marketing of industrial hemp. <laughs> This makes a lot of people shiver, including me sometimes, especially when the DEA is standing there. Uh, but, but we have been very consistent in our message. I don't think there is a product that's truly manufactured that can go into a stream of converse at any university, and I can tell you the Department of Ag has no ability to do that. I can't even grow industrial hemp because the limit of our space is a roundabout at the Department of Ag. That's all the space we own. We can't make, we can't grow industrial hemp in any quantity. We can't find a commercialized purpose. And so we have to have the, uh, con Congress had to have contemplated that there were other people participating. And that's been our position all along. And so some states call that a pilot program. They don't call it commercial. They just call it research and development pilot. Other states, like Colorado, have called it commercial. Some call it R&D. They call exactly the same thing we do, R&D. Unfortunately, our legislature called it commercial before there was a farm bill language. So we're threading a needle. Uh, it ensures that only institutions of higher education grow. Again, if you look at any state out there, there's only a handful that are doing very small research projects at institutions of education and most of those even subcontract to farmers so they're not doing it only at institutions of higher education. Uh, and then the, the, the one I always find fascinating, it says you have to register with us. Well if this were only Department of Ag, I know where all my property is, it's the parking lot. Uh, it's pretty easy to figure out where all the university property is, it's all public knowledge. Why would we go through the expense of registering it if we already knew where it all was? So it doesn't make any sense in the strictest context of what was written. And it authorizes us to promulgate rules. If we had to only write rules on the material we had, to the ability to grow, we wouldn't need to promulgate rules. There isn't any. Uh, and, and equally true, there wouldn't be very much at universities that would have to promulgate rules. And that pretty much would all fall right under this. Uh, ensures that you're only ones growing it. So where I want to get to just real briefly is when you read the Farm Bill language, just like you read almost any language, you have to understand where it came from. The Farm Bill language was inserted in 2014 by Mitch McConnell, okay? Mitch McConnell works in a state where the Department of Ag is not the regulator. The Department of Ag in Kentucky is marketing agricultural products. The, the departments, the universities are the regulating folks. So the system works perfectly in some states, but only about a handful of states are set up that way. So you have to understand what it was written, the concept it was drawn from, and that doesn't fit most states, which is why most states have always gone to the DEA and argued where their position is. And when I say argued, I, I, negotiated maybe is a better word for it, uh, because no one wants to litigate it, nor does the DEA want to litigate it. Uh, the DEA hasn't, lit no state has litigated against the DEA and the DEA has not litigated any program because we all understand that we all have a lot to lose. So we try to find ways to navigate our way through the mess, okay? So you just heard what the 2014 Farm Bill was and how lack of clarity we all are, are working in and, and, and states are all different because of the, the system we all have set up. 
the landscape we're all dealing with is also changing very quickly. Uh, you're going to see that uh, there's a Commodity Farm Handlers Act that passed last year. There's Amendment X, which would remove the THC limit from the Constitution. There's the uh, House of Representatives Farming Act. There's a proposed uh, farm bill. And we have a hemp authority bill that we're going to be working on. So what will change? Uh, if you notice here, this is a much broader definition of what industrial hemp is. It's what it is. And it's, uh, it, it even goes further and talks about how to measure it, OK? Some of the provisions that you're going to see in the hemp farming bill uh, and, and the farm bill are that states have to submit a plan to the USDA. So we'll have to submit a plan that they approve, or we won't have a hemp program. So that has some limitations that go with it, including make sure that our THC limit conforms to the federal limit, because if it doesn't, we won't have a hemp program. Uh, it'll affirm uh, that you have to register. Uh, uh, the, the part that I think is really exciting for most is funding at the universities will become available, crop insurance for farmer, banking will be there. It removes it from the controlled substance list. There's a number of things that are clearly laid out in this farm bill that weren't laid out before. Uh, what's not uh, always as clear as we wish is it talks about shipping across state lines once everybody is approved. Where we're at today is the DEA still believes you can't ship material across state lines, and they believe that the Omni spending bill that many people believe says they can't do it doesn't limit them because they're the, it is a funding limitation and their funds are not all driven by federal appropriations. So there are, there's a case right now in West Virginia where a farmer is potentially losing his farmland because he imported material, seed, from Kentucky to West Virginia. And so that occurred this summer at some point. So. Uh, I guess the message I, I want to convey is that where we're at today is probably not where we're going to be at tomorrow, probably not going to be where we're at five years, and definitely not where we're going to be at 10 years from now. So I'll take any questions there are. <laughs>